Welcome back. We are still going on Physics GRE GR 0177 Solutions. We are picking up on problem number 11. An object is located 40 centimeters from the first of two thin converging lenses of focal lens 20 centimeters and 10 centimeters respectively, as shown in the figure above. The lenses are separated by 30 centimeters. The final image formed by the two lens system is located where? So for the thin lens equation, the one, one over DO plus one over DI equals one over F. Um, for lens one, one over 40 plus one over DI equals one over 20. One over DI therefore equals one over 40 and DI equals 40 centimeters. Uh, for the object, it's gonna be positive distances if it's to the left of the lens. The image is going to be positive if it's to the right of the lens. It's important to remember. The first image from the first lens becomes our new object for the second lens. It is behind lens two. So the image distance from the second lens is 40 centimeters minus 30 centimeters equals 10 centimeters. The image as a new object for the second lens is minus 10 centimeters. So now for lens two, it's gonna be negative since the new object is to the right of the lens. 1 over minus 10 centimeters plus 1 over di equals 1 over 10 centimeters. 1 over di equals 1 over 5 centimeters and di equals 5 centimeters. And that is answer A. Number 12. A spherical concave mirror is shown in the figure above. The focal point F and the location of the object O are indicated. At what point will the image be located? So 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F. Um, since F is greater than DO, then 1 over DI must be positive. Uh, positive images are to the right of the mirror. Only V, uh, so Roman numeral number 5, has a positive image distance. So therefore, it must be answer E. Number 13, two stars are separated by an angle of 3 times 10 to the minus 5 radians. What is the diameter of the smallest telescope that can resolve the two stars using visible light where lambda about equals 600 nanometers uh, and we're allowed to ignore any effects due to Earth's atmosphere? We can apply the Riley criterion where 1.22 lambda over D equals theta. Uh, one nanometer, again, refer back to our cover sheet, equals 10 to the minus 9 meters, so let's plug everything in. D equals 1.22 times 6 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by 3 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, so this can equal 2.44 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, and that is going to equal to about 2.5 centimeters, and that is answer B. Number 14, an 8 centimeter diameter by 8 centimeter long NAI detector detects gamma rays of a specific energy from a point source of radioactivity. When the source is placed just next to the detector at the center of the circular face, 50% of all emitted gamma rays at the energy are detected. If the detector is moved to 1 meter away, the fraction of detected gamma rays drops to, uh, so let me refer to the beautiful diagram below, and uh, rays will just disperse spherically. So when pressed against the 100% efficient detector, again, it's going to be 100% efficient uh, since half of the gamma rays go through the source when pushed against it and half go the other way. See the diagram. Uh, so A1 is going to equal pi r squared, radiation emitted against the circle face. Uh, diameter equals 8 centimeters, so the radius equals 4 centimeters. A1 is going to equal 16 pi. Okay, so A2 is going to equal 4 pi r squared. That's our sphere of radiation. Uh, so r equals 1 meter equals 100 centimeters. Uh, so A2 is going to equal 4 pi times 10 to the fourth. So A1 over A2 is going to equal 16 pi over 4 pi times 10 to the fourth equals 4 pi times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, this is the gamma ray detection density. It's going to drop by this amount of area uh, increase due to the spherical dispersion. And so that is answer C. Number 15, five classes of students, just like you and me, measure the height of a building. 
Each class uses a different method and each measures the height many different times. The data for each class are plotted below. Which class made the most precise measurement? Uh, so high measurement precision means the measurements are all close to each other. Precision is independent of accuracy and close measurements means a narrow x-axis in this graph. Uh, so answer A has the most narrow width from the mean and that is our correct answer. The student makes 10 one second measurements of the disintegration of a sample of a long lived radioactive isotope and obtains the following values 3021240125. How long should the student count to establish the rate of an uncertainty of 1%? So our average is going to equal the sum of the measurements divided by the number of measurements. That's going to equal 20 divided by 10 and it equals 2. So our Poisson distribution, it's going to be discrete. Uh, probability of a given number of events occurring in a fixed interval of time or space if these events occur with a known constant rate. That is what we have here. We're going to apply it. In the Poisson, Poisson distribution, variance equals the mean. So sigma equals our standard, standard deviation and the square root of the variance equals the square root of 2. So our time in seconds equals the number, number of counts, which is per the problem. Uh, and our uncertainty equals 1%, so it's going to be 0 0.01 times 2 equals 0 0.02. So basically, we have our t time equals n, our number of counts, equals sigma squared divided by the uncertainty squared, which is going to equal our variance divided by our, our uncertainty squared. Let's plug our numbers in that we have. 2 divided by 0 0.02 squared is going to equal 5,000 seconds. That is answer d. Number 17, the ground state electron configuration for phosphorus, which has 15 electrons, is. And so our superscript is the number of electrons where our shells are s, p, d, f, g, dot, 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 and our subshells are 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, dot, dot, dot. And each shell can hold, our s shell can hold 2, our p shell can hold 6, our d shell can hold 10, our f shell can hold 14, our g shell can hold 18. So we're going to just fill each shell and subshell from the bottom up. And so that's going to give us our 1s2. Uh, that subshell has 2 out of 2 electrons. Our 2s2 subshell has 2 out of 2 electrons. Also, our 2p6 has 6 out of 6 electrons. Our 3s2 has 2 out of 2 electrons. Now we run into our last three electrons. The 3p3 has 3 out of 6 electrons. And so that is answer B. Number 18, the energy required to remove both electrons from the helium at atom in its ground state is 79 electron volts. How much energy is required to ionize helium, i.e. remove to just remove one electron? So our energy to remove a lone electron bound to a nucleus, E, is going to equal 13.6 EV times Z squared divided by N squared, um, where Z squared is our number of protons. And so in this case, n is going to equal 1 and z is going to equal 2 because it's helium. So E is going to equal 13.6 eV times 4 and that is going to equal 54.4 electron volts to remove a single electron if it was the only electron bound to a helium nucleus. The problem states it takes 79 electron volts to remove both electrons and it would take 54.4 electron volts to remove a single electron if helium was already ionized and only had one electron. So now if there are two electrons to remove just one of the two electrons it would take 79 electron volts minus 54.4 electron volts equals 24.6 electron volts. Notice it takes less energy because with two electrons, there's electron shielding, so they are less tightly bound. So that is going to be answer A. Number 19. The primary, primary source of the sun's energy is a series of thermonuclear reactions in which the energy produced is C squared times the mass difference between uh, so hydrogen fusion is the dominant process that generates energy in the core of main sequence stars like our sun. Uh, see the diagram provided below. Um, 
for the proton-proton chain reaction details. And four protons separated, which is hydrogen, has more total mass than the nucleus of helium, two protons and two neutrons. Uh, the total energy released is our change in mass times c squared. And so the difference between those two is the sun's th thermonuclear reaction, and that is answer B. Number 20. In the production of x-rays, the term bremsstrahlung refers to which of the following? Now we're going to see our diagrams below. Decelerating charges will emit a continuous spectrum of photons. Rapid deceleration, which is colliding with a target metal, for example, creates high-energy photons. Bremsstrahlung x-rays. And so that is going to be answer E. Okay, that was another set of 10. I will see you in the next set of solutions.